children our future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. Give them a sense of pride. It'll make it easier. Let the children's laughter. Let it remind us how we are used to be. Never found anyone who fulfilled my needs. A lonely place to be. And so That's the thing about technology, it's wonderful when it works. <laughs> Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be made acceptable in thy sight. O oh God, you are our strength and our redeemer, so bless us now, God, in this preaching moment. Right here and right now, God, pray that your word will go forth and never come back void, but accomplish the purpose for which it is sent. Send it forth right now, God, as a two-edged sword to cut between the marrow and the bone to find sin where it is hiding in undiscernible crevices in our souls and to 
Find our wounded places and provide a healing balm. Send it forth, God, to provide wind in deflated sails and strength in places where we're weak. Let it, God, bring illumination and discernment and understanding where our minds have been darkened and confused. But God, never let it come back void. So bless us now in our needful places and in needful ways that we may be the children you would have us to be. In your name we pray and give thanks. Let us all say together, amen. Would you stand with me all over the building? If you can stand, please stand. And um, somebody hustle over there and hand me my glasses. Amen. It's not that I really need them, but I... I do, oh, no, I got them here with me. It's, it's sad. You get to a point in life... You can't read without glasses. And you're looking for stuff you already got in hand. Amen. What you, what you need. Amen. 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 I knew where they were. I was just going to see if they, would, if they would help a brother out if I needed it. I don't need these glasses and I didn't need no help. I'm just, I'm just saying what I'm saying. Uh, First Kings... 22nd chapter I want to begin reading at the first verse and I'm going to read down through the uh, 22nd verse first Kings the tw I'm sorry the 21st chapter first Kings the 21st chapter I'm going to read down through the 22nd verse Once a year, I drag out this hot, not so attractive Oxford type robe because I really believe there was wisdom in what Langston Hughes said one becomes what one beholds. And for our children, you can't have enough education. Where people always believe faith and education are two twin pillars that allow a people to rise. And uh, we need no less faith in God today than we had on yesterday. We still need to believe that the Lord will make a way somehow. And we still need to understand that one of the major ways he makes the way is through education. And I pray that no child in here ever say, I cannot afford to go to college. Now, everybody don't have to go to college, but everybody got to get some training beyond high school to be employable. From high school to this day, and I say this not to embarrass my family, no strike against them because they're just another black family trying to make it. And a mother with five kids don't have no extra money. Not one Lincoln penny toward any of to my bachelor's, master's, or doctorate degree came from my family. And somebody say, how did you go to college? I had a get smart theology. Just keep walking and the doors will open. <laughs> Rationally, you would say, I couldn't afford to go to college. No, the reality was I couldn't afford not to go to college if God was going to do something with my life. So I don't care if your mama broke, your daddy broke, and ain't nobody in your house had a job in three generations. If you want to be something in life, study like you're going to college, fill out applications like you're going to college, and pray every night and say, Lord, I'm going to try you by your word. You said you would open up the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing. And I dare you to lie to me and watch and see if God won't put people in your path like he did mine to get you to college. So I don't want to hear any young person in this church say you can't afford to go to college. You can't afford not to go if you want to do something with your life. Now, that's my preliminary sermon. Let's get to the main one. There's the only reason why I wear this hot boxy robe. That don't do nothing to flatter my physique. <laughs> Sometime later, there was an incident involving a vineyard belonging to Naboth, the Jezreelite. The vineyard was in Jezreel, close to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. Ahab said to Naboth, let me have your vineyard to use for a vegetable garden since it's close to my palace. In exchange, I will give you a better vineyard or, if you prefer, I'll pay you whatever 
it is worth. Naboth replied, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. Ahab went home sullen and angry because Naboth the Jezreelite had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. Ahab lay on his bed sulking and refusing to eat. His wife, Jezebel, <laughs> came in and asked him, why are you so sullen? Why won't you eat? He said to her, because I said to Naboth the Jezreelite, sell me your vineyard, or if you prefer, I'll give you another vineyard in its place. But he said, I will not give you my vineyard. Jezebel, his wife, said, is this how you act as king over Israel? Get up. Eat. Cheer up. I'll get you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name placed his seal on them and sent them to the elders and nobles who lived in Naboth's city with him. In those letters, Jezebel wrote, proclaim a day of fasting and seat Naboth in a prominent place among the people. But seat two scoundrels opposite him and have them testify that he cursed both God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. So the elders and the nobles who lived in Naboth's city did as Jezebel directed in her letters that she had written to them. They proclaimed a fast and seated Naboth in a prominent place among the people. Then two scoundrels came and sat opposite Naboth and brought the charges against Naboth before the people saying, Naboth has cursed both God and king. So they took him outside the city and stoned him to death. Then they sent word to Jezebel, Naboth has been stoned and is dead. As soon as Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned to death, she said to Ahab, get up, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, that he refused to sell to you. He's no longer alive. He dead. When Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, he got up and went down to take possession of Naboth's vineyard. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who, who rules in Samaria. He's now in Naboth's vineyard where he has gone to take possession of it. Say to him, this is what the Lord says. Have you not murdered a man and seized his property? Then say to him, this is what the Lord says. In the place where dogs licked up Naboth's blood, dogs will lick your blood. Yes, yours. Ahab says to Elijah, you have found me, my enemy. I have found you. Yes, I have found you, he answered, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. I'm going to bring disaster on you. I will consume your descendants and cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will make your house like that of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and that of Baasha, son of Ahijah, because you have provoked me to anger and have caused Israel to sin. The scripture as it is written, and it is always our prayer that God would bless us in the reading and in the hearing of his most holy word. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord and each other. Turn to your neighbor, take them by the hand and say to them, neighbor, neighbor. I, don't I don't think the pastor looks so bad in that role. <laughs> no, 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 that's not what I want you to say. <laughs> I needed that. It just made me feel a little bit more secure. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor, take them by the hand and say to them, neighbor, neighbor. Don't, let don't let your success go to your head. To your head. Come on, turn to somebody else and say, friend, friend. Don't, let don't let your success go to your head. To your head. Put your pointer finger, stick it in your chest and say, self, self. let's not, not make the mistake, the mistake. of letting our success Go to your head. Amen. A song James Cleveland said, when you get a little money and get on your feet, why do we change? He said, today might be bright as the noonday sun, but you can wake up tomorrow and find all your 
blessings gone, don't forget to remember where all your blessings come from. It is true. Most of us start off in, from humble origins, simple people from simple places. By the grace and the hand of God, we climb the ladder of success. And sometimes along the way, we forget where we come from, who brought us from where we come from, and even why he brought to bring us there for his own glory and his own might. And sometimes people who made it where they got to be by praying and crying and crying and praying, when the fish are no longer frying in the kitchen and the beans are no longer burning on the grill, they've done all the crying and got up that hill, when they get up to the big leagues and having their turn it back, all of a sudden, sometimes people can let their success go to their head and can end up having a Humpty Dumpty experience. You remember old uh, Brother Trumpty, I mean Humpty? <laughs> Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, but Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And then all the king's horses and all the king's men could not put Humpty Dumpty back together again because he sat so high. The higher they are, the harder they fall. And when Humpty hit that ground, he shattered into so fine a piece, nobody could put him back together again. And at the end of the story, the story comes down to Humpty let his success go to his head. And that's the story behind the story of the events that unfold in the 21st chapter of 1st Kings where we find the story, another story about Ahab, king of the northern half of the kingdom of Israel in that time in history where they were a divided monarchy after the death of Solomon, son of David. And he reigned in Israel whose capital was in Samaria and one writer said Ahab did more to anger God than all the other kings of Israel combined. Now the story about Ahab starts way back in chapter uh, 16 and uh, continues on through chapters 23 and chapter 4. This is another episode in the sad saga of a man who let his success go to his head to his own peril and the peril of those around him. The scene unfolds in this chapter where Naboth, who, uh, or um, Ahab, uh, while he was king of Israel uh, and the capital city of the northern half of the nation, uh, Israel, was in Samaria. His hometown was in Jezreel. And so not only did he have a monarchical palace in the capital city of, of Samaria, but he had also built for himself at the cost of the people and the nation, a separate palace, a spacious, uh, opulent palace for himself in his hometown. He had a separate residence in his hometown of Jezreel. Um, but when you ask the question to people who have enough, when is enough enough? When you ask a rich person, when do they ever have enough money? When you ask famous people, when do they have enough celebrity? When you ask... Uh, uh, celebrity personalities, when do they get enough attention? Enough is never enough. They s the appetites simply get larger. The ego gets larger. It becomes a, a bottomless pit of, of appetite and desire and vanity run amok. And so not only did, was he living already, Sister Linda, in an opulent palace, but he wanted more. More, more, more. How do you like it? How do you like it? More, more, more. And so he decided that outside of the balcony to the master bedroom of his palace, he wanted to plant a little garden or a, should I say, a voluptuous garden. And the problem was the land in immediate proximity to his palace belonged to a man named Naboth. Naboth wasn't a somebody. His name was not lifted up in lights. He was not from one of the prominent families, not from one of the Levitical or priestly families. He was a, a nobody, a no name. He had not much money or wealth, prestige or prominence. The only thing he did have was a piece of land. It was a patrimonial piece of land. 
By that I mean it was a piece of land that had been passed down in his family from generation to generation. And it connected him to his ancestors, to his elders, to his identity. Naboth or Ahab wanted the land. It was strategic. When he looked at that piece of land, Chuck, he simply saw a parcel of land that allowed him to make an expansion to his already opulent palace. And so he approached Naboth and said, listen, your land is in a, over the fence of my palace. Here's what I'm going to do. This is a great opportunity for you. It's going to be a great investment and windfall for you. He says, I will give you in return for this parcel of land, multiple parcels so that you can rebuild and resettle. He says, or if you would like, I'll pay you whatever price you want for that land. Forget about market value. Name your price. When you have the treasury of the nation at your disposal, money is no problem. Uh, but to his surprise and dismay, Navin says no. You cannot put a price, Joe, on history. You can't put a price on ancestry. You can't put a price on family legacy. You can't put a price on identity. This piece of land was more valuable to him emotionally and sentimentally. It was as much an heirloom as it was an investment. It was priceless. And he told him no. Then he told him again no. He became like the Capital One man. The answer is always no. The text tells us that Ahab then went home and went into a full-grown, grown man pout. He not only pouted and was angry, he laid on the bed, curled up in fetal position, and wouldn't eat. Bad enough for a child to throw a temper tantrum. But a grown behind man laying in the bed, pouting, and won't eat because somebody told him no. In walks Jezzy. Somebody say Jezzy. In walks Jezzy. Naboth wouldn't take any money for his land, but he ran into a chick who wouldn't take no for an answer. In walks Jezzy, and Jezzy inquires of her husband. Now, Jezebel and Ahab were a political marriage. Typical of the day and time where in arranged marriages, a wife was not chosen as the byproduct of a dating process where love was the pursuit. Love was irrelevant to these marriages in times past. If by chance you happen to love your wife, that's good, but it wasn't necessary. This was about political alliance. She was a Phoenician princess. This was to strike an alliance of the Phoenicians and the Israelites for purposes of military and trade expediency. But she was a Baalist. Her people worshiped the pagan god Baal, who was to, believed to be the god of fertility and weather. She was an aggressive sort of woman who pushed more for the practice of her faith in Baal than Ahab did the proper worship and faith in Yahweh, the God of Israel. And when she walked into the room and saw her husband crawled up in fetal position, pouting, angry, not even eating, and inquired what it was all about, he told him how he went to Naboth, offered him money for his land or other parcels in exchange for the land, and he told him no, and he was upset. She challenged his manhood. This is how the king of Israel uh, behaves himself. When a nobody like Naboth tells you no, you're actually going to take no for an answer. She says, you lay here and pout. I'll put on the pants and I'll show you how a king is supposed to get his way. She, she proceeds to write a letter in the name of Ahab, writes it on Ahab's letterhead, forges it, passes it off to the elders of the people and says, call for a great fast and banquet in Jezreel. And since a Naboth is also a citizen of Jezreel, invite him and put him in a prominent place. But we're going to stack it. 
invite two scoundrels, two people on their way to the Republican convention and have them <laughs> present. Have them present at the feast. And when the time is right, have them bear a false witness. The law said any two people agreeing to the same story, uh, that their, their combined witness would be accepted as fact. That's why you not bear false witness. You get people killed, lying on somebody. And they stood and said that Ahab has cursed both God and the king, the penalty of which was execution by means of stoning. That being heard, they took him out on the day of the feast on the outside of the city nat, and they bludgeoned him to death with stones and then sent word to Jesse that the deal was done. Upon that time, Jesse told Ahab, get up, man. Now go down to Jezreel and claim the land in eminent domain since Naboth is now dead. But that wasn't the end of the story. Sometimes when you think you have done the deal and you've washed your hand and you think nobody seen that, there is somebody who sees everything. You can fool some of the people some of the time, a whole lot of people all the time, but you can't fool God none of the time. God dispatched the Tishbite, Elijah, who had had some episodes already with Ahab. Says, go on down to Naboth's vineyard, and you will find Ahab there. And when you get down there, tell him this. Tell him, number one, I sainted, it. And tell him, number two, because I sainted, it. Because he's given his way itself over to evil, I want you to tell him this. I'm going to bring disaster on his family. And that disaster is going to include, I'm going to cut him off from every man in the nation, slave or free. No man is going to have anything to do with him. He's done some stuff that no man will respect him as a man when you dispatched your wife to take out another man while you sat at home crying. It's bad enough that you had him killed. It's bad, but it's even worse that you sent your woman to do it for you. I'm going to separate psychologically all the men from you. And then secondly, I'm going to cut off your posterity. I'm going to treat you like Baasha, who had been the king of Israel, son of Ahijah, and treat you as well like Jeroboam. Well, who are those factors? Well, I'm glad you asked. Jeroboam was the successor to Solomon in the king, in the nation of Israel. Uh, God was displeased that while Solomon prayed a prayer that God would give him wisdom to lead the people, it ain't what he prayed for, it's what he pursued that spelled his legacy. He pursued money, wealth, wisdom, and money, wealth, and fame, so much so he split the nation and in the, in the reign of Jeroboam, his son, that split came to pass. Ten of the twelve tribes peeled off from the southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin, and they had a divided monarchy for 200 years until the Samaritans destroyed the northern part of the kingdom in 721 B.C. And when God sent Elijah to, to, down to Ahab, to tell him that I am going to treat you as I did Jeroboam, Jeroboam's descendants were cut off when his son succeeded him on the throne and was assassinated and there were no more members of that family. Baasha was the third king of the northern half of Israel whose son was executed as well. He names two kings prior to Ahab whose sons were executed so that the family line would be cut off and says now that Ahab will suffer a similar fate because he has executed an innocent man to take his property. Be all because he let his success go to his head. Somebody say, don't play with God. Just when you think you got somebody, God will come along and make sure you get got even worse. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't play games, you might get got.
Three things, lessons that we learn from this story, the story about Ahab that I want to leave you with, and then I'm going get to get on out your way so you can get on with your day. Number one, we learn from the story of Ahab, no matter how high God allows you to rise, nobody can have everything that they want. Let me say to these graduates, because it is certain that more things are going in your favor than are going against, or you wouldn't be here today. It, you wouldn't be here today if you were not intellectually gifted. You would not be here today if you were not artistically talented. You would not be here today if you did not have a sufficient support system around you so that you could achieve, set out, and achieve your academic goals. And certainly more doors will open to you in life than doors that will close. You will likely become familiar with success, prosperity, prominence, favor, and good fortune over and over again in life. Yes, you will have your valleys. Yes, you will cry your tears. Years. Yes, you will have your midnights along with your daybreaks, but you will be as you already have. We will, you will be no stranger to success. But don't let your success go to your head and let you think you can have whatever you want. See, that was, Na that was Ahab's problem. As a king, he asked for food that somebody else cooked. As a king, he asked for the chariot to take him where he wanted to go, and he didn't have to drive. As a king, they me measured him and brought him his wardrobe and even dressed him, and he didn't have to shop and didn't have to save and look for sales and clip coupons to get the clothes that he wanted to wear. As a king, he had people at his beck and call, at his disposal, 24-7. As a king, he had people who literally asked him, Master, what is your will? Your wish is my command. And there's nothing like success to make you confuse the difference between a blessing and an entitlement. When you are used to getting what you want, you can develop a false sense of entitlement and think that you can have whatever you want, and before you know it, you become a full-blown narcissist. You remember the legend of Narsi? Narsi was a young man who was riding his horse along a roadside one day as the sun beat him down, and he became thirsty, and he stopped his horse when he saw a pool of water, dismounted from his beast, bent over to cup his hands, and drink from the pool, when all of a sudden he was surprised to see his own reflection on the surface of the pool. He became so mesmerized at the sight of himself, he leaned further and further over to get a better view of himself, and eventually he lost his balance, fell off in the water, and drowned in his own self-love. Nothing spoils like success, Howard Thurman says. Seeing your name lifted up in light, seeing your name printed on the bulletin in honors, hearing your name called, having people applaud when your name is called, getting special designation, getting VIP seating, getting special treatment. Nothing spoils like success. And after a while, you start confusing blessing with entitlement and think that somebody owes it to you in the first place. They asked Michael Jordan in an interview, Marla, they said, can he explain to him what it was like to live life as a celebrity? And he said, well, the best way to put it is this. He said, several years ago, I was headed into New York City to go to one of the finest restaurants in the city, and he said, I was late, and he said, and when I got there, the restaurant was closed. There were other people lined up trying to get in, and they were turning them away, and he said, and I stepped up. And he says, at first they said to me, we're closed, but then somebody recognized me. And he says, and they turned the sign around, let me in, pushed everybody away, and they said, we're sorry, Mr. Jordan. At first we didn't recognize that was you. He said, but we have a table here waiting for you. He says, celebrity is when you live by different rules than other people. When you live by different rules than other people, when the lines are for others and they take you on through the back door, when other people see a certain price, you get yours for free. When other people have to stand because there's no more seats, but they make somebody get up so you can sit down, that can turn you into a full-blown narcissist who thinks you can get whatever you want. But nothing could get you in trouble faster than thinking that you are now entitled to have whatever you want. Nobody can have have whatever they want. Touch your neighbor and say, you can't have everything you want. 
I saw a woman in Safeway not too long ago in the checkout line. She had a child in the cart, and he was looking at the candy. The candy was like pookie, and that crack, it be calling me, man, it be calling me. That candy like crack was calling that little boy, and he reached out for it. And she, like you and I, was raised by people who believe that if you tap them little hands and legs when they're small, they won't be slapping you when they get big. That's that pre-Dr. Spock type of parenting when parents were still in charge. And he reached for the candy, and his mama said, <laughs> he pulled his hand back, started to holler, she said, shut your mouth. Leave that alone. And after a while, when she was waiting in line, when she wasn't looking, he started to reach again. And she said, <laughs> and he pulled it back. He started hollering. And then the man at the, at, at, at the ke checkout counter was looking real concerned because she got him good. She got him so good the second time, my hands started hurting. <laughs> but something was wrong with this little child. Something was wrong with him. He may have been a diamond in the rough, Joe, but he was really rough because, you know, maybe he subscribed to the mentality, if at first you don't succeed, try, try, try again. And he was literally reaching the third time, and I said, Lord, she going to kill him. He reached, and she, and she grabbed his hand to get a firm grip and said, Payow! The thing rang through the whole store. The man, the white man behind the cash register, Got so upset, he was getting ready to call somebody. She said, put the phone down, stay out of this. She says, I'm getting him now so that the police won't shoot him later. He can't have whatever he wants. Come on, somebody. I don't care how much God gives you, you can't have whatever you want. No matter how high you climb, there's still limits. There's still boundaries. No matter how cute you are, you may be able to get every man's attention, but you shouldn't be trying to get every man's attention. Brothers, you may be charming enough to charm a whole lot of ladies, but you ought not be trying to charm every lady. You may have the money to buy most of the things you want, but some things you should walk on by and leave it on the shelf. You may be able to do this and do that, but everything that's within your reach, you ought not to take hold of because some of the things you take hold of will turn around and take hold of you. You can't have whatever you want. The second thing we learn in Ahab's story is that the more earthly power you get, you have to grow proportionately in your empathy and respect for others. Otherwise, you'll just become another bully who exercises his power, privileges, and prerogatives uh, in a way that is not just and not righteous. Or let me say that in the positive. As you grow in power, privilege, prominence, you have to make sure that you grow in your empathy and regard and respect for others proportionately so that you can exercise your power, privilege, and prominence with righteousness and with justice. Ahab believed that because as a king, what he wanted, he should get. And used, in cahoots with his wife, the powers of government corruptly, deceitfully, insidiously, manipulatively to get when he didn't deserve on its merits. He used the apparatus. He used the power of the pen. He used the presidential seal to concoct a scheme. He used others at their beck and call to set up a situation where he could take by any means necessary what he wanted because Naboth believed that people were things to be played with and not to be, person, not to be reckoned with. He had gotten to a point in his mind where instead of using things to help the people that he loved, he used people to get the things that he loved. Because he had no empathy. Jezebel had no empathy for Naboth, no regard for Naboth, no appreciation for his family, no respect for things like legacy and history and heritage. All she wanted was what she wanted and to prove that as king and as queen, they should have whatever they wanted. See, Jezebel and Ahab by association were of the mentality, what's the point in being king? 
if you can't throw your powers around every now and then. Every now and then, if it, what's the point in being king if you can't be like LeBron and throw Darius on green down to the ground and let him know that I'm the only rock roller on the court and you're just a little poodle who just keep chirping. So I'll throw you down and step over you just to let you know I'm stronger than you. Now they're losing in the series, but it was a muscle flex. What's the point in having muscles if you don't flex them every now and then? Can I get a witness now? It's... <laughs> What's the point in being cute if you can't flaunt it? What's the point in having money if you can't go out and get a nice car and impress people and doll yourself up like diamonds? What's the point in being able to sing if you don't just sing even when it ain't necessary or called for? What's the use in being famous if you don't stretch your stuff? Some people believe ain't no point in having what you have if you can't show it off in vain convulsions and genuflections. Rather than understanding you are blessed to be a blessing. Naboth needed to have, or Je Ahab needed to have a Henry Ford type of transformation. Y'all know who Henry Ford is? Henry Ford, yes. Henry Ford did three things that's important. The third one that doesn't get enough recognition. Number one, Henry Ford invented the automobile and shrunk the distances between point A and point B and how long it takes for us to get there. Number two, Henry Ford invented the assembly line. So they went from building things, one specialized craftsman at a time, which was more time consuming, required a more specialized workforce, but to he invented the assembly line where semi-skilled people and low-skilled people could simply be on an ever-moving assembly line and have a singular task to attach this bumper and, uh, and, and drill these bolts and it keep on moving so more people became employable. And then more products could be made more quickly and more efficiently and more people qualified for meaningful work. But the third thing he did that changed history and lifted many people from poverty into middle class status and that was Henry Ford voluntarily paid his workers more than what he had to, which meant he took a smaller amount of profit off of each automobile assembled because uh, off of each automobile assembled, but he did it for this reason. He wanted the people who made, who assembled the automobiles to be paid well enough to be able to turn around and buy the very automobile that they were assembling, believing that while I might make less off of each automobile because of what I am now paying in wages, allowing them to share in the fruits of their labor, he said, I'll make it up on volume by selling more cars to more people. And history is the story of the fact by taking a smaller profit off of more cars sold because the people who make them can now buy them, Henry Ford ended up being the wealthiest man on the planet to that point in history, the wealthiest man the world had ever seen, but he also lifted tens of millions of people, not only in this nation, but abroad, out of poverty when he, by creating the assembly line and paying people better wages so that they then could buy the products they were assembling. In the words of Robert Reich, the Secretary of Labor under Bill Clinton, he believed in the virtuous cycle rather than the vicious economic cycle where if the wealthy will take a smaller share of an expanding market, they'll get richer in the end than if they try to take a larger share of a shrinking or a contracting market. Some people need to know that today. If you pay your workers better so that they can spend more money, then you're going, the rich will always get richer. The question is, are they the only ones who will share in the bounty of the land and the horn of plenty? It's the virtuous versus the vicious cycle. He's, Naboth needed, Laman needed, Ahab needed a Henry Ford type of conversion to care more about the people around them. We need in this country, while the one half of 1% is claiming 80% of all new wealth in society, they need 
to pay more for their workers. They need to provide better benefits for their workers. They need to care for the little people who make their products that make them rich because no rich man became rich without the labor and the efforts of a poor man who's picking their fruit, who's making their products, who's sewing together and putting together their shoes that their names are going out. Without a poor man, there can be no rich man. Have I got a witness? But thirdly, and finally, Naboth needed, not Naboth, Ahab needed to understand that no matter how high you go in life, you need to remember if you are a child of God, that the goal spiritually should to become more power filled than to become more powerful. Huh? Let me say that again, because I want you to wrap your mind around this. As a child of God, no matter how high we go in the church, in society, in the school district, in the political stratum, in the business world, in the entertainment industry, no matter how many powers, prerogatives, privileges that we acquire, the goal is not to become more powerful, but to become more power filled. What do I mean by that? Today is the fourth Sunday in the season of Pentecost. You remember Pentecost? Jesus told his disciples, go wait in Jerusalem till you receive power from on high. Because the work I need you to do to go into all the earth, preach the gospel to every creature, you cannot do of your own strength. The prophet Zechariah has said, not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Wherever God takes you in life, as prominent, privileged, prestigious people. The goal needs to become more power filled so that whatever po earthly powers you have or do not have, you exercise them under the compulsion of the Spirit of God. Ahab's problem was he got obsessed with being powerful, but he was not power filled. He was not controlled by the Spirit of God. Paul says in Ephesians 5, 18, be not drunk with wine, that's wasteful, but be filled, which means controlled by the Holy Spirit, so that whether you're president of the United States or you're a principal of the local school or whether you are a policeman entrusted with the powers of the badge and the gun or whether you are an entertainer with a microphone in your hand spitting lyrics that are either going to dump toxic waste into the tissues of another impressionable generation or you're going to bust wisdom on how people can make themselves and the world a better place that you need to be filled, controlled by the Holy Spirit so that you exercise your powers with justice and with righteousness in a way that honors God and ultimately honors yourself. See, Ahab found out the hard way that no matter what power you have, ultimately power belongs to God. Have I got a witness? Because God dispatched the prophet Elijah, said, Elijah, go down to Jezreel. Be, and, and I want you to tell Ahab, I saw what he did. Tell him, I'm going to separate every man from this nation, from him, bond and free. Tell him, I'm going to cut off his family line. Tell him he's going to pay a high price for abusing his powers on a little simple man who had a simple piece of land because he couldn't stand for anyone to tell him no because the success that I blessed him with, he let go to his head. So now all I can do is show him that not e even when you become king, you ain't so high that I can't pull you down. Have I got a witness? Ahab found out that power still belongs to God. Pharaoh found out that power still belongs to God when God drowned his chariots and horses in the sea. Uh, Pilate found out that power still belongs to God. Even when you release Jesus to a mob, power still belongs to God. Caesar found out that power still belongs to God. One writer put it this way, Caesar may occupy the palace and Christ the cross, but that same Christ will rise up, split history into A.D. and B.C., so that even the reign of Caesar must be dated by his name. Power belongs to God. Hitler found out that power belongs to God. Confederate generals found out that power belongs to God. Nixon found out that power belongs to God. O.J. Simpson found out that power belongs to God. 
Have I got a witness? Bill Cosby found out that power belongs to God. I believe Donald Trump is going to find out that power belongs to God. And not just big people in big places, but little people in little places need to realize that power belongs to God. Parents slapping around children need to remember power belongs to God. Teachers abusing kids more concerned about contracts than learning need to realize that power belongs to God. Politicians only worried about getting reelected rather than passing laws that make life better for the constituents that put them in office need to realize that power belongs to God. Doctors more concerned about personal wealth than public health need to realize that power belongs to God. Pookie and Ray Ray need to realize that power belongs to God. You can break in my car if you want to, but God can break in your life when he gets ready to because power belongs to God. Have I got a witness? You see, Naboth was not the only person who was executed on trumped up charges. Oh, haven't you heard? You didn't hear about the man from Nazareth who was wounded for our transgressions, who was bruised for our iniquities? Some scoundrels got around him and they said that he blasphemed the name of Caesar, said that he told folk don't pay taxes to Caesar, said that he was going around threatening the throne of Caesar, when in fact what he said was that my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate washed his hands of him. The crowd that ate the fishes and the loaves betrayed him. The disciples that had walked with him walked away from him. He was wounded. He was bruised. They laid him in a borrowed tomb. But when they came back Sunday morning, they found out that power belongs to God. Because on Sunday morning, he got up with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. I come to tell somebody this morning, don't let your success go to your head because it is the Lord that lifted you up. It's the Lord that gave you the brain to learn. It's the Lord that gave you parents who care. It's the Lord that opens doors that no one can shut and shut doors that no one can open. It's the Lord that picks you up when others knock you down. It's the Lord that's your high power and your strong defense. It's the Lord that builds a hedge of protection around you. It's the Lord who's able to keep you from falling. It's the Lord who picks you up when you fall. It's the Lord who's got the answer to the Humpty Dumpties because he can put you back together again and again and again and again if it had not been for the Lord on your side you would have been confused how many of you in here today know that it's only because of the Lord you are who you are you are where you are you got what you got you got it the way that you got it it's not I but the Christ that liveth in me touch your neighbor and say neighbor all this is because of the Lord. Have I got a witness? Say the Lord made me smart. Say the Lord made me cute. Say the Lord made me strong. Say the Lord made me gifted. Say the Lord forgave my sins. Say the Lord picked me up. Turn me around. Set my feet on solid ground. Say the Lord calm my fears. Say the Lord gave me what I got. So I'm going to give him all my praise. Somebody say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for every mountain you brought me over. For every trial you brought me through. For every blessing. Hallelujah. For this. Let all the blessed people find three people.
people slap them a double high five and said, I have not let my success go to my head. Have I got a witness? I have let my success go to my knees. Don't let your success go to your head. Let your success go to your knees. Don't let your success go to your head. Let your success go to your knees. Because every day you need to get down on your knees and say, Lord, keep me. Keep my heart. Keep my mind, keep my soul, keep my tongue to speak your praise. Keep me, lest I fall. Keep me, lest I make a fool out of myself. Keep me, lest I hurt somebody. Keep me, lest I hurt myself. Keep me, lest I waste my gifts. Keep me, lest I waste my opportunities. Keep me. I waste your will. Keep me, Lord, in the morning. Keep me in the noonday. Keep me late in the midnight hour. Keep me now unto him who's able to keep us from falling. Present us faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, to him be glory. Majesty, dominion, and power now and forever. Say yeah. Say yeah. Yeah. Hey. 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 the building we're on our feet congratulations to all of our graduates on a day when all of us are rehearsing in our minds the breakthroughs the advancements and all the privileges and uh, successes and decruments in our lives that we have because of what God has allowed us to come into most of us my age and older you didn't grow up on Nintendo. You grow up on mayonnaise sandwiches. You grow up with three cans of grease on the stove in the kitchen. Huh? You used to go into restaurants and take lemon, ask for lemon with your water, and then use the sugar on the table to make lemonade without paying for it. You took the scripture to say, lay hands two or three gathered together, touching and agreeing. And you and your wife, when you got in your first car, you laid hands on the steering wheel and prayed that when you turned the key, it would kick over. Long way from that luxury car you're driving in now. Somebody say, the Lord did it. Come on, say it like you mean to say, the Lord did it. Say all this, the Lord did it. Don't let your success go to your head. Just remember, you can't have everything. There's some things in your reach you shouldn't reach for. Have I got a witness? And the more God gives you, the more compassion you ought to have for others and not just say, I got mine, you get yours. Have I got a witness? Don't look at poor people and act like they got flawed character because your mama was poor and it's her character that got her out of poverty. Poor people are the hardest working people in the world because when you got to take next to nothing and make something, that's hard work. It's a lot harder than going in a restaurant, throwing down a credit card and just asking for what you want and not worry about how much it costs because you know you can cover it with credit. Have I got a witness? And we got to realize that as we grow in prominence, that we have to make sure that we're power filled, that the Spirit of God is compelling how we use what we got in prominence and privilege and where we are so that we don't become another bully, huh? Another bully who wants to enrich themselves off the misfortune of others, make fun of other people. Have I got a witness? I ain't talking about nothing but what I'm talking about. We can be big old bullies, artistic bullies, intellectual bullies, financial bullies, 
people who think they can run over other people. The lesson of Lay Ahab is you better remember where your blessings come from. Have I got a witness? Doors of the church are open. If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ in the pardon of your sins, I want to invite you right now to come. I offer you Jesus.